Good, <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your SETI Institute colloquium series. Uh, my name is Frank Marchis. I'm a researcher here at the SETI Institute and will be the host for the event today. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for, uh, for coming to our colloquium series. Um, I recommend you, ch if you have missed some of them, you check our SETI uh, YouTube page, which, uh, where you can find most of them recorded and you can listen to us speaking about our science over and over again. Um, we also some have some special um, uh, short movies now available. Um, so I would like to introduce our uh, speaker today. Uh, his name is Tom Bristow, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Bristow, sorry. <laughs> Thomas uh, got a bachelor in geosciences at the University of uh, St. Andrew in Scotland in 2002. In 2008, he finished his PhD in sedimentology, mineralogy, and geochemistry at the Department of Earth Science of the University of California at Riverside, so in California. Um, after a postdoc at the Division of Geo Geological and Planetary Sciences at Caltech, he moved to the Bay Area for a postdoc at NASA Ames and then became a PI at the SETI Institute. Um, a year ago, he left us to uh, become a civil servant at NASA Ames to work on the Mars Science Laboratory rover operation. And, he and he's been continuing his research on mineralogical traces of early habitable environment. So today, uh, Thomas' uh, talks will be uh, is entitled Paleo Environmental Reconstruction of the Identification of Habitable, Habitable Conditions on Ancient Earth and Mars Using Clay Minerals. That's a challenge for me. <laughs> uh, Tom, Thomas will discuss approaches to uh, a paleo environmental interpretation of clay mineral bearing sedimentary rocks with a focus on recent findings from the Mars Science Laboratory, uh, or called also MSL Rover Curiosity. Please, let's welcome uh, Thomas. Yeah, I think it's on. Okay, well, thank you very much, Frank, and thank you for uh, everyone for coming along. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as, as Frank mentioned, uh, I work at NASA Ames Research Center. I'm part of the, the MSL Curiosity Science Team. Um, more specifically, I'm affiliated with the, the Kemen instrument, which is the X-ray diffraction instrument that, that's on, on board the rover um, and can perform mineralogical analysis of uh, the drilled rock uh, powders. So, um, this talk, in this talk, I'll, I'll Towards the end, I'll um, talk more about uh, results from uh, MSL, from uh, Curiosity, uh, specifically at Yellowknife Bay. Um, but I do have a, sort of a terrestrial, earthbound, geological uh, background uh, and experience researching clays on the Earth. Um, so I thought it'd be useful um, to talk about uh, what we know about the clay record on Earth and, and how clays can be used in reconstructing environments. Uh, and for uh, in the search for organic remnants of life in the ancient rock record, and how that can be applied um, beyond the Earth to other planets like Mars. Um, so, um, to start with the the terrestrial, let's see if this is working. The terrestrial clay mineral record is actually in, in incredibly rich. Um, clay minerals are the most abundant mineral component in the Earth's surface and near-surface environment. So where the geosphere meets the biosphere, uh, clay minerals are the, the, the dom dominant mineral project products that are formed there. Um, they very often form in sort of moderate um, conditions, moderate, con moderate temperatures and pHs, and they require the presence of water because there's water, of course, in their, in their crystal structure. And they've been present on Earth for um, billions of years, uh, ever since there's been liquid water around at the surface of the, of the Earth and a, and a solid crust. Um, and it's really an indication the clays come hand in hand with um, uh, habitability and life being uh, present at the Earth's surface. So um, a, a clay means different things to different people and, and different uh, engineers and soil scientists and geologists. Uh, they all have slightly definitions of what clay m means. Some people just use it as an indicator of, of grain size, uh, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this in this talk, and uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about materials that are typically less than uh, two microns in size. 
Um, but as well as this size def uh, definition based on size, um, in particular, when I refer to clay minerals in this talk, I'm, I'm going to be talking about phyllosilicate minerals. So uh, minerals with layered structures, you can see this in the diagram on the left, uh, layered uh, sort of waffle shape, wa waffle type structures um, uh, consisting of a silicon uh, tetrahedron um, stacked in various ways and typically um, uh, intercalated by uh, octahedral layers. Um, so you can see the, the crystal structure, sort of the cartoon crystal structure here on, on the left-hand side, and then a, a TEM uh, uh, image of that crystal structure on the right-hand side. And you see the, the scale bar on that is, is 10 microns. So these are really tiny, um, tiny uh, crystal uh, uh, structures that we're talking about. So the clays are an incredibly diverse uh, set of minerals. Uh, I can't I don't have the time to go through and catalog, catalog sort of the main groups and the chemistry and things like that today. Um, but I, I guess some of you have heard of things like smectites and illites and chlorites. They're, they're kind of the major groups of uh, clay minerals that people investigate and find at planetary surfaces. But within those major groups, there are um, kind of subsets of more specific names which imply uh, particular chemistries and crystal structures and, and things like layer charges. So as, as with um, you know, most minerals, um, certain minerals are stable under particular uh, geochemical conditions, and certain types of clay minerals uh, form under particular conditions. Things like uh, kaolinite, I think m most people are familiar with, um, tend to form on sort of the acid side of the range of, of uh, conditions in which clays are stable. Um, and uh, so, using that knowledge and, and where the clays are stable in environments, uh, going back and looking in the, in the rock record, we can actually go back and investigate uh, what conditions were like on the early Earth and how they change over, over time. So this is kind of a, an idealized example here. Um, um, my laser pointer is not, not working. I'll just how it is working. Okay, so this is a cartoon diagram of an ancient um, closed lake system. I thought this would be a, a good example because we're going to be talking about uh, lake deposits on Mars a bit later in this talk. Um, so this is a closed lake system. Um, you see here it's called Lake Uinta. So it's an ancient lake um, that was um, present in parts of Utah and uh, Wyoming and Colorado about 45 million years ago. So this is a closed lake system. What do I mean by closed lake system? It means that water flows in, but the only way the water leaves is through evaporation. So this is essentially um, a, a system where ions, chemical species are being concentrated into the sedimentary basin. And what happens in these closed lake systems is that you have recharge from the sides of the, of the basins and concentrations as you go towards the center. So you have a s salinity gradients and pH gradients set up in these kinds of systems. And if you go, you can go back in the rock record and go to um, different lake beds in different parts of, uh, of the lake. So go towards the center or, or the margin, margins or the uh, sedimentary systems that lead into this system and examine the mineralogy and these uh, changes in minerals actually reflect that geochemical gradient as you go from the margin of the lake into, into the lake center. So this is, uh, and, and, and this is not just recorded in clay minerals, there's uh, other accessory minerals that record the same things as well. So um, salts and carbonates and, and things like zeolites as well. Um, so this, if, if you look at this, um, imagine this diagram, this is a, a snapshot in time uh, these deposits uh, over thousands and uh, tens of thousands of years uh, will m look more like this. And uh, you have this diagram here, this sedimentary log is showing alternation between um, uh, clay rich shales and carbonate rocks uh, uh, representing repeated wetting and drying and, uh, and migration of, and the, of the margins of that lake system. And those migrations are reflected in the mineralogy as well. So, th so this is a really um, sort of idealized uh, example of how clay minerals uh, from the rock record can be used to, to reconstruct changing uh, conditions in the past. 
it's typically not that um, easy. Uh, the, the clay minerals, even though they, they do point to certain conditions, uh, their origins are often non-unique. Um, for example, something like a smectite could form in, in a weathering profile. It could form at the bottom of the lake in a lake sediment. Um, it can form much later in the rock record uh, during diagenetic processes and hydrothermal alteration of the rocks as well. Um, there are potentially multiple sources for, for clay deposits typically. Um, you know, you can imagine a, a river system, it's going to tap um, uh, potentially a wide range of geological terrains um, and, and different sources of clay minerals. So there can be clays being formed in place and brought in from the outside as well. And, and uh, as I said uh, up here, um, the rocks can be altered millions of years later after they were deposited making you know, the timing of that and the timing and the significance of that signal unclear. So as well as looking at mineralogy, it's really important that uh, you look at contextual geo geological and geochemistral, ge geochemistry information to, to reconstruct the picture as best you can. So this is one of the big messages um, from studies of Earth that can be brought to bear on um, planetary studies of clay deposits as well. So uh, clays, I've, I've said they're incredibly abundant in surface environments. Um, they're uh, not just passive. They don't just sit around and form rocks and do nothing. Um, the small size um, uh, makes them incredibly reactive. Um, you can see I've put a figure up here of some clays have uh, mineral surface areas of up to 800 meters squared per gram of, of material. So that's a huge amount of potentially reactive surface area. Um, added to that is the, the clay structure sometimes uh, leaves uh, what's called a layer charge on, on, the, on, the, on the clay. So they have a net negative charge um, that requires balancing by either on inorganic cations or sometimes organic cations as well, which stick to the surface of the, of the clay minerals. And um, of interest to a lot of people just beyond the geological and planetary community are the catalytic effects of, of clay minerals. So, you know, you have large surface areas, they're reactive sites, they have charges, um, they can actually ca uh, catalyze certain chemical reactions. And this diagram here on the, on the right hand side um, is, is from a geology paper by Williams et al. Um, we're showing uh, this is a, a, a diagram of a, a smectite clay structure. Uh, and in a smectite clay structure, you can actually put organic material into the interlayers between the, the phyllosilicate sheets. Uh, so, and, and in this paper, she reacted um, simple organic compounds like uh, ethanol and methanol. Uh, and uh, these sites actually catalyzed um, the, the production of more complex hydrocarbons from. Uh, these simple ingredients. So, um, you know, clay minerals, I, I guess they bear quite um, uh, prominently in some of the literature on, on origins of life, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that in, in more detail right here. But I just wanted to, you know, get the point across that, the, um, you know, they're an incredibly important part of, th of the biosphere, and they're not just passively sitting there. They're actually, actually um, you know, they, they're very reactive as well. So uh, the clays, because of these properties and because of their abundance, um, they're as intimately associated with, uh, with biology. Um, I've just put up another picture, a TEM picture up on the left-hand side here. This is a picture, a TEM, a, a, a slice and um, electron illumination through uh, what's called a marine snow. So it's uh, 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 an aggregated material that falls down to the to the bottom of the ocean, and what it's showing, you can see the the, the scale here is one micron, is uh, very close relationships between bacteria, which are the circles, um, the 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 substances that they secrete, the extra polymeric substances, and so you can see these kind of um, wispy wafer platy things are the actual cr uh, clay minerals here, so. This is not just, uh, I want to stress that this is not just a, a physical proximity. They're not just stuck together in these aggregates. 
um, they're actually influencing each other. And um, there are a number of papers um, that hypothesize that the evolution of uh, life on land in particular influence the volumes and the types of clay minerals um, that were generated on, on the Earth. And that changed through time as, as life evolved on Earth, as um, you know, life moved out of the ocean and colonized the land. Um, this changed uh, what's called the clay mineral factory uh, uh, with uh, knock-on effects for certain geochemical cycles. Um, so certain microbes can actually uh, uh, use the metals that are in the, cr the crystal structures of the clays as part of their met metabolic reactions. But iron in particular, um, uh, the uh, uh, bacteria will um, uh, change the redox state of iron in clay minerals th through either through direct contact or electron shuttling compounds. Um, and there's also, um, uh, I'm not sure how many people are aware of it, there are medicinal per, um, uh, applications for clay minerals. So um, there are uh, certain deposits that, that have antibacterial um, properties and, be, and, and are very effective at, at um, treating things like uh, flesh-eating bacteria where, where you can apply the, the clay uh, topically on the, on the surface. So the clays and the, and the chemistry of the clays is actively helps uh, kill the bacteria as well. So there's a strong interaction between you know, the, the mineral component of the biosphere and, and the biology is, itself. So into the geosphere, so the, the, the close um, relationships between clays and organics, um, it's not just restricted to sufficient environments. Um, the, uh, the close association persists down into the geosphere. So as you uh, bury sediments, uh, the clay minerals and organic compounds remain very strongly bonded together within sediments, um, even during burial and, and heating. And, um, Clay minerals, by uh, uh, various mechanisms, actually enhance the preservation of, of, of organic materials, of organic compounds. So they can help um, preserve the remnants of, of life in the rock record. So you can then go back and um, uh, obtain more information. So uh, this is um, a cartoon of a, this is a cartoon micro, microorganism. Um, showing, and up here we have uh, uh, organic matter sticking to, to clay mineral and the microorganism not, not finding it very palatable. So this is, you know, a cartoon, a cartoon of what's going on, but um, uh, organics trapped in the clay minerals are not accessible to the enzymes produced by um, bacteria and things like that. So that's one of the mechanisms that helps preservation. Um, as I mentioned before, some people have hypothesized that the catalytic activity of clays can actually um, take simple organic compounds and, uh, and uh, produce more complex polymers that are uh, less uh, palatable to microorganisms as well. And, and there are other properties of clay bearing sediments that al also help preserve the organics. Um, what's, uh, you know, what's really uh, another cool thing about the, the clays and the organics and this relationship between them is that uh, they tend to alter a, a very similar under, under very similar conditions. So as you bury in heat organic matter, the, the structures are going to break down. Um, you're going to lose information. But during the same range of temperatures that, that happens to the organics, you have very um, sort of in parallel uh, alterations of clay minerals. So you can use uh, clays as geothermometers um, you know, to give you an idea of how rock how hot a rock has been heated during burial. And this is uh, particularly important to the, to the oil industry. So uh, the oil industry will look at a, a potential source rock and use clays to see how much it's heated uh, and whether it's been heated enough to generate petroleum. Um, but you know, this could be very important on places like Mars too, where um, uh, MSL, we've kind of gone beyond looking for habitable conditions to trying to find rocks that contain uh, organic uh, remnants in them. Um, you know, we can pick out targets based on mineral geothermometers like this that haven't been buried or altered uh, to, to, to any great extent. So that this is a way to, you know, to try and 
pick out the best targets that haven't been um, altered too much and have more potential to um, preserve uh, organic fragments. So with that, I'll, I'll move on to the, um, uh, the clay mineral record on, on Mars. Um, uh, clays on Mars uh, um, and, and information about clays on Mars is, is still pretty much in its infancy. Um, the, the field really took off about 10 years ago when um, Omega and, and CRISM started um, sending back uh, spectroscopic data of the surface of Mars, particularly near infrared, which can detect phyllosilicate um, uh, uh, functional groups, metal OH groups. Um, and uh, they found that phyllosilicates were uh, wi widely uh, distributed on Mars, just like they are uh, uh, on Earth, but unlike the Earth, um, they they are really restricted to ancient terrains. So uh, predominantly occurring in uh, Noachian terrains, uh, o older than 3.5 billion years ago, um, and the clays, the types of clays that you find on Mars are, are slightly different as well. So they tend to be magnesium and iron rich, whereas on Earth. Um, uh, right now, aluminium clays are, are more common. Uh, that's that's a, a driven by uh, the, the differentiation that took place on Earth and produced granite, granitic uh, continental crust. Um, so, and a surprising one of the surprising things about the the clays on Mars is that uh, these uh, uh, smectites, which are very sensitive to diagenetic change and alteration on Earth. Um, they'll start to change into other things at about uh, 60 or 70 degrees on Earth, are preserved on Mars for billions and billions of years, whereas on Earth, the oldest uh, smectites that can survive sort of the tectonic cycle uh, are about 700 million years old. So um, the early results from this, the spectrometers um, uh, led to this uh, idea of the o omega paradigm and the age of clays in the earlier Noachian, um, and it was thought that the, the clays were signaling a period in Martian history when the planet was warmer and wetter than it is at, at the present, and that the end of the age of clays and kind of replacement of by sulfates and then iron oxides uh, was an indicator of um, things drying out, um, things becoming more oxidizing and acidic, uh, and eventually most of the water um, going away from the surface of the Mars, uh, Martian surface. So that, you know, th this was based on early results and it, it was a, a broad global picture based on the, the temporal distribution of, of those main uh, mineral types. So um, then a few years later, especially when CRISM came along uh, and uh, more measurements were known, uh, more measurements were taken and um, more, more um, study went into this. Um, people begin to realize that the picture was a bit more complicated than a, a simple clay to sulfate um, oxide progression. Um, the clays were, were found in um, some, of the, some younger rocks too. Um, the mineral groups were not found to not be mutually exclusive, so clays and sulfates were found together in some instances. Um, so, and, and some of the lessons from the Earth began to be applied to the, the, the Martian mineralogical record. So, you know, things like uh, re realizing that secondary mineral pro assemblages are products of, of multiple processes and geological settings, and, and local, sometimes local effects can overwhelm sort of global trends in, in, in mineralogy. So, uh, you know, this kind of uh, brought this realization uh, brought about the, uh, the, the need for a bit more uh, information to combine with the mineralogy to try and reconstruct really what was going on. So this next slide shows um, some, of the, some of the work from uh, Bethany Elman. Uh, and uh, this, she, she, what, what she did was she examined um, not just the, the, like the clay mineralogy, she also tried to examine the minerals that came along with the, the, the clay minerals. And she also, also started to look at the, the um, geological terrains that were hosting those um, mineral deposits. And through this um, approach, 
uh, she started to find that um, the majority of the clay minerals were actually uh, found in um, what she called um, crustal, crustal clay um, uh, terrains, uh, and they were associated, uh, associated with other minerals, um, things like prehnite, pumpelliite, uh, other mineralogical indicators that the clays were actually formed at higher temperatures. So they didn't. So her thought was that the majority of the of the Noachian clay deposits um, were actually formed a bit deeper down in the crust, and they're not actually uh, reflecting surficial conditions. Instead, they're they're reflecting aqueous alteration of a basaltic Mars crust um, deeper down within uh, within the planet. So that that has important implications, right? Because um, you know, th this, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have a warm and wet surface of Mars that's, uh, you know, uh, 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 great for life. It, it could mean that the, the surface of the planet is still cold and wet at that, at that point. So th those are some of the questions that, uh, that, or developments that came up in clay mineralogy um, as uh, we appro approached the landing of uh, Curiosity. So this is, I'll just take, I'll just get my water one second. Yeah, I just left it. Okay. So, so that brings us to the third part of the talk. This is, um, results from Gale Crater from uh, Curiosity. I think most people are familiar with um, the landing site chosen for Curiosity. This is Gale Crater. Um, it was chosen because um, the mound in the middle of the crater, M Mount Sharp, um, contains stratified rocks. And the stratified rocks, um, at least from orbit, um, contain a similar mineralogical sequence as was kind of outlined in the Omega par paradigm. So in the lower parts of the, the strata in the mound um, are rich in uh, uh, clay minerals, particularly smectites. And uh, as you move further up, uh, uh, and uh, I, I guess through, through time, the thought is as you move up through time, uh, you, you transfer to uh, uh, more sulfate-rich mineralogies within the strata. So the mission went there to, to see, um, you know, to try and get a handle on what, whether global or local processes were, were causing this mineralogical transition uh, and, and what, this, what implications this, ha this had for um, reconstructing uh, ancient conditions on Mars. Now, um, the rover couldn't actually land on the side of Mount Sharp. He had to pick a nice flat place to land. Um, kind of off, off to the side of um, Mount Sharp. You can see the, the landing ellipse here. And actually, um, just this past September 2014, um, the rover uh, officially reached some strata that are at, at the base, uh, affiliated with the base of Mount Sharp. So it's, so it's taken quite a while to get there. Uh, uh, but luckily, the landing site was um, Right on top of another, uh, uh, you know, interesting geological feature uh, called the Peace Valis Van. You can see um, a topographic map here with uh, the the Peace Valis van, van shedding material off the northern rim of the crater and down towards the landing site. So the landing site was kind of at the toe end of this alluvial fan. Um, so th you know, this represents a, a, a very exciting, potentially exciting um, geological. Um, scientific target as well. So um, just to the, the east, about 500 meters east of, the, of where the rover actually landed, um, there was a, a group of rocks called Yellowknife Bay, which looked particularly interesting to this, the science team. They looked um, from orbital images. You could briefly see uh, stratifications within the rock. Um, they were at a, an important sort of geological boundary. So the science team uh, uh, made a decision to, to take a traverse over there soon after the landing of, of MSL to investigate that, that section of rocks. And they were, they were not disappointed. So uh, at Yellowknife Bay, um, uh, 
the rover found uh, a series of sedimentary rocks, um, a, a series of siliciclastic mudstones, siltstones, and sandstones uh, of basaltic bulk composition, uh, and uh, sort of uh, observations and sedimentary analysis of this sequence of rocks uh, revealed was actually the remnants of an ancient fluvial lacustrine system. So where um, rivers had dumped material down into the crater, and this was actually the tow end where um, some ponds existed at some time. So the fight, you know, in, in this stratigraphic column, you can see the sheet bed mudstone here overlain by sandstones and coarser conglomerates. Um, so the, the sheet bed mudstone would represent the pond and the, and the sandstones would represent the migration of, of body bodies of, uh, of rivers uh, going into that pond. And uh, the mudstone was, you know, highlighted as a particularly um, attractive science target. Um, it's it as I said, it represents the standing body of water and uh, certain di early diagenetic features within the sh sheet bed uh, mudstone um, indicated that aqueous interaction continue with uh, the deposits after after the de deposition of the mudstone. So um, MSO undertook a, a drilling campaign at Yellowknife Bay and two holes were drilled um, in, in the in the sheet bed mudstone, one called John Klein and one called uh, um, Cumberland. So d as I said, I'm on the I, I have my biases on the on the MSL science team. I'm part of the Chemin team, and I'm a mineralogist. So um, I'm going to show you some of the mineralogical data that MSL um, got back from those um, drill holes. You can see um, the the ring diagrams up in the top left picture, th those are actually x-ray diffraction patterns that came back from those um, two sets of powders that were drilled from uh, the sheet bed. And uh, below that, you see these um, sort of conventional 1, 1D views of diffraction patterns. So uh, the, the 2D pattern was translated into, into 1D patterns. And you can see uh, on the diagram, hopefully, uh, the major uh, mineralogical components of those sediments. So as well as the typical basaltic components that you'd expect in this kind of system, things like olivine and pyroxene and, uh, pyro and uh, plagioclase feldspars, they also have significant um, clay mineral components as shown in the low angle region down highlighted here, and this hump below the sharp peaks uh, indicates the presence of an X-ray amorphous um, component in the sediment as well. So uh, these XRD patterns were um, analyzed uh, to obtain uh, quantitative mineralogy that, that, you know, this kind of gives you in numbers what, what I just went through. Um, the clay minerals make up about 20, 20 weight percent uh, of the of the component of, of these mudstones, uh, amorphous material makes up about 38 percent, and then also of interest in these um, mineralogical compositions are the, are the relatively low uh, quantities of olivine you see there, uh, three percent and one percent res respectively. This is kind of unexpectedly low um, for this region based on uh, orbital data. I think the orbital data would predict somewhere up about 10 or 11 percent. Um, and, and we also found, which was very surprising for uh, fine-grained uh, lacustrine deposits, quite high concentrations of, of magnetite in there. Now that's, that's unusual if um, the magnetite, you'd expect it, it's a, it's a very dense, heavy mineral it should be associated with the coarsest grain sediments. So it will fall out of the water very fast, whereas in the mudstones, so in the mudstones, you, you don't normally expect to, to find those kinds of concentrations of magnetite. So th that's, that's kind of what stood out from this data. Um, more details on the clay mineralogy. If you go back, um, I'm going to zoom in on this uh, low 2 theta region of, of uh, of the XRD patterns and, and give you some more details. You can see that the, the position of, the, so these peaks, what they represent in terms of the clay structure is the spacing between phyllosilicate layers. So you have stacks and this, the position of this peak um, represents the, the spacing between stacks in, 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 your, in your clay mineral. And you can see um, John Klein and Cumberland that 
what's called the 001 peak representing uh, the, the stacking height, if you will, was actually uh, slightly different. One was at 14.3 angstrom, and then for John Klein, uh, it was 10.1 uh, angstroms. So for, for clay mineralogists, this is a, a kind of dead giveaway. This spacing is a dead giveaway that uh, this is a, a two to one type clay mineral, something like a, a smectite or a nilite where you have uh, two tetra tetrahedral relays um, sandwiching uh, an octahedral sheet. Now, in terrestrial studies of clay minerals on Earth, a very common way to distinguish between an elite, which is a non-expandable clay, and a, and a, a smectite, which is a, an expandable clay, you can actually stuff things into the interlayer, as I was showing earlier, um, it is, is to fit manually put things into the in interlayer and change that that despacing. Um, so this change that we saw going from, from Cumberland to John Klein is kind of reminiscent of that. Um, so it, it's kind of, um, you know, uh, pointing towards the, this, uh, the, the clay minerals at uh, Yellowknife Bay are actually smectites rather than illite. Um, there's also geochemical information. Um, the concentration of potassium uh, within these deposits uh, looks like it's too low uh, for, for the clays to be uh, elytic. Uh, elytics, uh, elytes uh, have potassium in, uh, in their interlayer spaces that are trapped in there and that they're, they're what's, what's balancing the, the, um, the layer charge on the clays. So this, this looks very much r reminiscent of a, of a smectite on Earth, except on, on Curiosity we can't do some of the diagnostic tests that, that clay mineralogists would do um, uh, if you had a sample on the lab, in the lab. So uh, uh, another, uh, a couple of other lines of evidence uh, supported um, this inference of a smectite. Uh, other regions of the XLD diffractogram, this, this is called the O2L region around between, you can see 22 and 23 degrees, two theta. So the, the position of this peak, this reflects how full the octahedral uh, layer is and what kind of metal is in the octahedral layer as well. As well. So by comparing the, the position of the peak from um, the Martian clays with um, known terrestrial standards, um, the, the clay was identified as an as a iron saponite. So this is a smectite that um, its octahedral sheet is um, almost fully occupied by metals, um, magnesium and iron in particular. And there's another test for this. Um, the, the samples were delivered to the SAM instrument, this, uh, which performed uh, um, uh, EGA anal analysis. So you heat up the sample and release um, volatile com compounds from the sample. And um, clays actually will dehydroxylate, so they'll lose their water. It's like when you uh, put some pottery in a kiln and you want to harden it out, you, you cook it up to a high enough temperature that it loses its water and, um, and, and goes solid. Well, the, t the temperature at, the, at which that happens actually reflects the, the chemical composition of the clay. So, and this, the SAM data, the dehydroxylation temperature, um, it was up there between 700 and 800 degrees C is um, consistent with the X-ray diffraction uh, identification of an of a iron saponite. So what about the origins of, of this clay mineral and what are the implications for the, for the clay mineral? So there's you know, a number of possibilities. This, uh, the clays in the Yellowknife Bay samples um, could potentially have been brought in from somewhere else. So I showed you the picture of the Peace Vallis fan and how that was shedding material from the crater rim um, down towards the floor of the crater. So this potential that this, this clay mineral that, was, uh, that we found um, was actually uh, produced in the rim of the crater and just brought to that site later on. And the, you know, uh, there are a couple of ways in which clays could have been produced in the rim of the crater. Uh, when the crater was produced, it tends to set up hydrothermal systems in, in the crater rim, circulating water and, pr and producing alteration of basaltic rocks to produce clay minerals. Um, you know, we, we have a, a fluvial, um, active fluvial system as shown by um, uh, orbital geomorphological evidence. So it indicates perhaps some pre precipitation on the rim 
uh, uh, which was driving that deposition, and that could have also produced alteration of, of basaltic materials on the rim. And, and then the other po another possibility is that the clays are actually formed in place. So you have the, the sheet bed mudstone uh, consists of very fine grained basaltic de detritus kind of sitting in a pool of water. So the other possibility is that um, uh, that alteration happened in place and the, the clays weren't brought in from somewhere else. So um, there are uh, uh, several key observations that uh, actually support that uh, latter idea that the, the, the clay minerals were, were formed in place and they're reflecting conditions at the time of deposition. Um, perhaps the most important is the bulk chemistry of that sheet bed mudstone uh, is, is pretty much exactly equivalent to the average Martian basalt. So, um, so you know, in typical in sedimentary systems, if you, um, what happens is something called chemical differentiation. So weathering products um, will uh, be transported down the system and the, the weathering products will have different compositions from, from the bulk rock from which they're derived. And so that way you'll get a, a change in chemical composition. But in this case, um, there's no change in com chemical composition. So that, that, that indicates that um, the, the minerals that were produced were just alteration products of, of the rock just sitting in place. Um, as I mentioned before, we saw uh, the, a systematic depletion in olivine levels within uh, the sheet bed mudstone and uh, enrichment, unexpected enrichment in, in magnetite. And if you actually write down that chemical reaction, um, uh, olivine, going to produce saponite, clay, and magnetite, uh, the mass balance for the quantities that we acquired uh, actually works out. And then uh, the third uh, observation that supports this in, in, in situ um, production is the, is the relatively simple clay mineral assemblage. So if, if you imagine a, in a hydrothermal system or a weathering system, um, you have large gradients in temperature and water to rock grade ratios in those systems that will tend to produce um, a, a variety of clay mineral products. So when you weather those types of um, materials, the sedimentary rocks that you, that you tend to get are, are kind of complex mix mixtures of different types of clay minerals. So the relatively just simple clay, one type of clay that we identified at Yellowknife Bay, um, that also I think supports uh, in, in situ or, or alteration, alteration of olivine. Um, pr to produce uh, saponite and, and magnetite. And we, we have um, some sedimentary evidence that this um, process took place quite early, some early diagenetic features that indicate the um, e expansion of, of the sediments before they had actually lithified. And this is what you'd expect if you go from olivine as a very dense mineral uh, to produce a, a clay mineral that's less dense, uh, you get uh, cause expansion uh, of the sediments and cause, de cause deformation, which are recorded in the sedimentary structures. So what, what are the implications for this um, discovery of, uh, of clays at uh, Yellowknife Bay? Well, if, if you look at the, the kinetic constraints on the reacti reacti reactivity of olivine, so how long the olivine actually takes um, to produce clay in the presence of water, um, uh, it, it gives you some idea of how long that the water was present at the, at the surface of a um, uh, Gale Crater at this time. How long did it take the water to alter the olivine to produce, produce that, that saponite? Um, the, the estimates that you get from that range from thousands to tens of thousands of years, and they actually match up quite well with the, the depositional estimates of how long it took to, to um, deposit that um, fluvial lacustrine system. So the, the presence of saponites also implies um, quite benign chemical conditions. Saponites are not um, stable in, in particularly acidic conditions. Um, I think below, if you go below about pH 5, they become destabilized or, and will dissolve. Um, you typically see them forming in, in waters with pHs of eight or nine. Eight or nine. So this, this kind of implies an, um, a, an aqueous system that was not too extreme in the potentially habitable. Um, and with the magnetite there, there was also evidence for iron in, in mixed valence uh, states. So a mildly oxidizing environment 
uh, and this, um, you know, I, I won't go into this in this talk, but um, th there are a whole bunch of organisms on Earth that, that can make a living by uh, cycling iron between the various re its redox states and make a living that way. So, so you have uh, indicators of benign sort of habitable conditions and a potential source of energy for life in this system as well. Um, all coming from sort of the mineralogy and, and the geochemistry um, obtained by the rover. So, um, so the, the campaign at Yellowknife Bay, this took place quite a long time ago, I think over two years. And since that time, the rover's um, driven almost uh, another 10 kilometers towards Mount Sharp um, and towards you know, its primary science target. Um, you can see Yellowknife Bay up up here, and then since then, um, the the rovers performed sort of two drilling campaigns at different sites: the Kimberley, and then uh, at the Murray Formation, which is the the basal unit of of Mount Sharp. More recently, um, clay minerals have been detected in some of those samples, um, unfortunately, uh, but they're in smaller quantities, so it's kind of harder to, um, you know really pin the identification on those uh, as we did at Yellowknife Bay. And the, and the ideas about those uh, detections are, are still be, being developed by um, the Kemen and, and MSL teams at the moment. So, um, so I won't go into those today. But um, the, the future look, looks really bright for, for Curiosity. Um, as, as I said, we've just reached the, the basal units of Mount Sharp and, and we've just Again, beginning the traverse up towards uh, the clay bearing units and the, the sulfate bearing units. So there's a, there's a lot of exciting material ahead for the rover to investigate. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and the main, um, I guess, mission success was declared after Yellowknife Bay because, um, you know, a, a habitable environment was, was um, identified there. But the extended mission, uh, there's going to be a more focused effort on trying to find rocks that uh, may, the most likely rocks that have hosted or, or, or any organic remnants of, of life. So a big part of that search for um, organic materials is going to be looking at the mineralogy and chemistry and of the rocks and, and trying to find the most likely candidate, candidates. So with that, that's, thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. Well, we have one over there. Hi. Hi. This is the big one. Uh, so in the first part of your talk, uh, and you discussed the origins of clays on Earth, you mentioned that uh, we can see evidence in the clays of life interacting with the clays in, mm. in its formation model. And on the Martian side, you said, well, the iron could be a source of food, whatever. Um, in your modeling of the formation of the clays you discovered at Yellowknife Bay and, and elsewhere, um, do, either, do, do any of those potential models indicate that kind of interaction between life and clay that you see on Earth? Or are all the clays that are forming on Mars, I in the quantities that you see them, uh, able to have formed without any life? That's a, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I you know um, I I I think that that formation process is is thermo thermodynamically viable. It's where the reaction wants to go by itself, and, and so it it doesn't necessarily imply life was involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, we have a question here. Maybe I misunderstood, but I thought you said at the beginning of the talk you didn't see as much aluminum as expected. And yet, you know, the silicates are basically aluminum silicates. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they have a lot of aluminum in them, generally. Yeah. So is, is that generally true? There's less aluminum than you expected on Mars? Um, uh, th there is. The, the clays tend to be magnesium iron rich type with with um, typically less aluminium than you would find on an earth equivalent 
And I, I think that's because, um, you know, the, the surface of Mars hasn't gone, undergone as much differentiation as, as the Earth has. On Earth today, you know, the, one of the major clay factories is, uh, uh, is the continental crust, which is very aluminium rich. Um, and um, the process of in intense weathering and, and uh, sort of intense hydrological activity will tend to concentrate the aluminium in, in weathering profiles and soil. So that's why you tend to get aluminium rich clays on the earth today, because of that differentiation process and because of the vigor of the hydrological uh, cycle. Now, um, you know, it's questionable. On, on Mars, you have a different kind of starting protolith, and you probably also get, got a less vigorous hydrological cycle as well. But I mean, I think um, uh, some of the spectroscopists can talk to this more, but th there, there are some aluminium rich uh, clay deposits on Mars that you know, may, may indicate that sometimes you have um, more intense uh, hydrological processes. So I have a question related to this, in fact. Yeah. Um, so when you decide the direction of the rover, you use data coming from the remote observations, right? Sure. Um, is there any, in the direction that the rover is going right now, is uh -huh. there any area where you can expect to see this uh, this clay, which are more complex? And have been, this has been. I wonder if this has been seen from the from space, and that is the rover is going toward this direction at the yeah. moment. Yeah. So, so I mean, um, you know, the one of the primary reasons for picking that landing site was because the clays were very obvious from orbital data in in strata of, of the lower mound. Um, so, so that's why the rover is is really going there. Um, uh, in the landing ellipse, uh, there weren't any clays detected as far as I can tell. I think the rocks were too dusty to, b f to be seen from orbit. So the, so the mineralogy kind of came as a surprise. I mean, I think people suspected that when they saw the geomorphological evidence of a sort of a fluvial system and maybe um, lake beds at the toe end of that, you, you kind of predict there to be clay minerals there. but. Um, but that was at the time that wasn't known from from orbit, so it it, it, it was a, it was a nice surprise. But um, I I guess there was some trepidation in making that initial detour away from the the primary goal of Mount Sharp to to the area at Yellowknife Bay. But it, but it, it it paid off, and um, you know it's it's the consequence of understanding um, the geomorphology and the sedimentary record and and, and predicting things that way. Are there uh, any implications for from the clay mineralogy for what the partial pressure of CO2 might have been in the atmosphere? <laughs> um, well, I, I think so. And this, um, um, like soon after Omega came back with detections of clays on Mars, um, I, c I can't remember the author, but uh, a group in France performed some thermodynamic calculations uh, and they, you know, they set they they uh, they calculated the level of PO PCO2 where you'd expect to have uh, clays being produced as well as uh, with carbonates being produced as well as the clay minerals as well. So that that kind of gives you a rough threshold on PCO2. Um, but of course, at that time, um, you were looking at orbital uh, orbital observations, and it was very hard to produce uh, hard to um, prove that those clay minerals were actually being produced close enough to the surface that they would be, you'd expect them to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So th this, you know, the, the findings of, of the MSL rover is, is very important because because of the sedimentology and, and all the detailed work that the rover's done and the, uh, the depositional models as well. You can actually say that the, this clay formed pretty close to the time of deposition, very close to the atmosphere so then you can go on to um, play with like things like kinetics and um, sedimentary burial rates and try and get a handle on how much carbonate you'd expect in that system um, if, the, if there was a high PCO2 atmosphere. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But I have a relating question again. Um, yeah. you, um, you intimate with the operation of the rover, you're a mineralo mineralogist, so why what kind of uh, 
prediction can you tell us about what's going to happen in the next year? <laughs> And this <laughs> this is recording, so remember, <laughs> we're gonna use it after against you. The the <laughs> the, pr the prediction. Um, uh, I I don't know. I I, I haven't. I, I mean, I'm really excited uh, to see what the exact mineralogy uh, of those units are gonna be. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't have any predictions right now. I don't <laughs> you don't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just, um, you know, I, my, my thinking, I kind of lag behind. I, I gave a talk about Yellowknife Bay. This is something that was done two years ago by the rovers. I'm, I'm still thinking about the implications of, of that data. So I, my thinking tends to kind of lag behind where the, where the rover is. <laughs> so. One more. You spoke about the uh, feldspars and silicates. Mm -hmm. Do you expect to see any carbonates? Have um, you found any carbonates? No, they haven't found any carbonates. I mean, that's that's a significant thing. So, um, as Robert was implying, this is this is a, re a reactive basaltic sediment. If there was significant carbonate in the atmosphere around, then you'd expect to see carbonates around. So there's there's a big um, uh, quandary there. So you have evidence of sufficient water for extended periods of time, thousands of years, but you don't have any evidence for the key greenhouse gas that would have let the, the water be stable at the surface at that time. So that, you know, that's, that, that's something that I'm thinking about now and I'm sure other people are thinking about right, right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your talk, so much. And as uh, a memory of your talk here, you're going to have this uh, wonderful cup. And uh, please have your coffee and your <laughs> coffee in it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Frank.